Hey, John. How are you today? Oh, fine, thank you. Am I early? Oh, just a little teeny bit, uh, but we can we can start. And uh, first off, do you have any questions in particular? No, I'm, you know? I'm really just interested in uh, what you guys and gals have done uh, with your link budgets. And, um, oh, okay. Yeah, that's I, actually something that we need to update um, because the link budgets from the original uh, work by Jan King um, are have a different modulation and different coding, so they will be they will be different. <laughs> <laughs> I would hope so. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. No, we. Uh, so but you're saying the FEC coding has changed? Yes. Um, the let me make sure I get it right. The um, I'm not sure if there was any. There, yeah, I think there was some forward error correction on the uplink um, from from Jan's work from the original HEO proposal. Let me go see. I'll go ahead and get it open. The downlink is definitely different. Since we use a can, we'll be using a concatenated code uh, from the from DBBS2 and S2X. Um, mm -hmm. But the, let's talk about the uplink, which at a at a pretty rudimentary level is is working, although we don't have the the frequency deviation that we want yet. Mm -hmm. It's power. And then, oh, there we go. Okay, so the uplink originally was one half rate sequential plus RS, which I am going to assume meant Reed Solomon. Reed Solomon, right. And with the spectral efficiency of about a half a bit per hertz. Mm hmm and they were looking at five kilobits per second or about 10 kilohertz channels. Mm -hmm. And we are looking at larger ones and a larger bit rate. So the, the bit rate of the, of the vocoder is 16 kilobits per second baseline. So that's where we're starting at. And we're, we're thinking we can get away with a hundred kilohertz channels. So it's roughly a hundred 100 kilohertz channels, um, but we need to to do more over the air work and then look carefully at the Doppler. And then the the question has been asked if we want to stick with requiring a coherent receiver um, or if we if we need to separate out the uh, the tones. It's four airy FSK. We want minimum frequency shift keying, or whether or not we whether we want to space them out at the symbol rate instead of half the symbol rate. Mm -hmm. And so those are the the questions that we're that we're working on and now is really the time to do the the link budget work to run all of that stuff again and to republish it. And let's see is there anything else from here? No. Okay, so that's all the assumptions that that, that that's pretty much it's a different uh, a different uplink so it's not like a, a if if they're doing um the original idea was 10 kilohertz channels i think that's like a thousand simultaneous users although it says 100 users here on the downlink so i don't think that they were thinking about occupying the entire subband on yeah yeah and and we we're we're going to we're going to go ahead and do that if we can Mm -hmm. Occupy as much as possible. So anyway, that's from the uh, the PowerPoint that's in the repository. That's what I'm looking at. I didn't want to try to remember all, recite all that from memory. So the so I guess the I'm I'm just gonna take you know uh, 
repeat the action item to to go ahead and get the the link budgets done or updated. We were happy with QPSK um, a couple of years ago, and we were looking at, at on a five gigahertz uplink that you'd need a couple of watts and a reasonable sized dish, and that was plenty, and it, mm -hmm. it looked like it would it would work fine, uh, and that was without uh, any uh, error correction on the right. the uplink at all. The type of error correction that we have is a, two different types. There for the header. Uh, or what we call the frame header, it's a Golay encoding, the the 12 to 24 one that, that is uh, used most commonly. And then uh, it's a convolutional, a half rate convolutional code Convolute. for the rest of it. Right. And it's a, a, a straightforward and standard um, design. And we have reasonably good performance um, with, the, with the depth um, that we're that we guessed um, just based on similar designs. So uh, we'll, we will push it both forwards and backwards uh, to mm -hmm. see if there's any anything else that can be, you know, for, for either performance or latency. Um, mm -hmm. And we're doing the standard interleaving. So there's, there's interleaving in order to improve the performance of the convolutional code and then whitening or scrambling in order to, um, to make everything look good. So all, all the usual things are, are being done for the uplink. Today, we worked uh, a little bit in the lab, and I don't have an answer yet, but we picked up, uh, for, for experimentation, we often use the MD380, which is a HT. Um, and this is a, a VHF, UHF, or actually U the MD380 is UHF only at HT. And what we're trying to do is to see if that actually can be um, used for for some yeah. of the uh, demonstrations and for some of the experiments. Yeah. Since we're looking at like about a, a nine kilohertz deviation for four area FSK, so it's a lot wider than the usual um, bandwidths from the from the Titera. But we didn't see any reason why we couldn't try to uh, to use some of the the modifications that are commonly done in the community and then go ahead and try it to see how what yeah, the maximum deviation is it'd be yeah. kind of nice so that's something that we're that we're that we, i wanted to finish it before today's meeting but it, um, paul is still still working on it we yeah. we have to remove a, a one more capacitor in order to get the the filter to to be open enough to do it yeah. and then the firmware from open rtx uh, turns off things like pre-emphasis and turns off filtering um, and then we comment out uh, a little bit of code, and then we're able to to drive signals, and then we'll measure the the maximum deviation. So it'd be nice to add another uh, bit of hardware for for people to experiment for both space and terrestrial. Yeah. So this is obviously a terrestrial solution. Uh, another implementation that's that's made a lot of progress is the uh, HackRF plus the PortaPack. Um, we were stopped for a little bit by an interesting problem. There is a a microphone transmit application. Uh, and the bandwidths are plenty, plenty wide for this, for what we're doing. Um, but the the transmit, the FM transmit, you know, just a simple FM transmit mode on the on the HackRF and the PortaPack, the the audio quality was terrible. No. It was really bad. It sounded overdriven and uh, pretty trashed. And it turns out that the the audio codec was not set up uh, the way that it probably should have been. So there mm. was. A um, a filter setup and a and a you know the, the patterns the, of of digital stuff that you send off to the audio codec when it first fires up was just not being done. The one of the the sets of instructions did not exist in the table in the data sheet. So fortunately, that was you know even somebody like me can figure out that it's not being set up right. It didn't require any you know super difficult uh, coding or reverse engineering. And now yeah. the that particular combination sounds really good. Okay. Um, so we may be able to get into the the build that everybody uses uh, with our uplink protocol, um, and then people can ex experiment with it with a hack RF and a porta pack. The porta pack is really neat. It just gives like a it turns your hack hack RF into essentially a really big HT. It gives you a screen, a touch screen, and a f five way button and um, 
a rotary rotary dial um and then it's i mean that's that's pretty much all you need for for good solid user interface uh so our idea is to use that and uh try to finish that up for sounding rocket tests for opulent voice uh, oh. over the next year so oh. yeah those are those are all the updates uh from that are recent for the for the uplink um oh. And I should probably show you something else that we're trying to decide because you might be able to give some opinions on this. I think I'll go ahead and try to share the screen and I'll show you the layering for the for this for the uplink. Because we are gonna add from here, you know, which um it, it works over the air, but from here we are adding um, quite a bit of overhead. So there's a, there's, there's a way that there might be a way around it. Okay, so you should see some orange boxes. Yes, I do. Okay, so in the overview, overview of our current implementation, um, so from left to right, it's like the you have the IQ samples that goes into a, essentially a physical layer. And then we have our uh, P4XT uplink frames. Um, and then there's Opus. So Opus is the, the open source voice codec that, that we're using. OK, so that's kind of like the layers and it's an overview of the current implementation. What we want to add to that is, so we have a physical and, and the uplink frames, but we want to add IP, UDP, and RTP, or the real-time protocol, and then the Opus uh, packets. So um, I said frames before, but there, mm. when you there's a there's a there's a, a already a standard for putting Opus into RTP, which does give you a lot of benefits that would be very good for digital voice. So to have a real time protocol, and when you load up Opus into RTP, you have to put them in there in a packet format, which means you add one byte. So it's one byte header for for Opus. Okay, that's not too bad, but when you get to RTP then I think it's on the order of like 12 bytes. Uh, UDP, I think is eight and IP, I think is 10 or 20, you know? And so we're starting to look at a lot of overhead for, yeah, you're you know. Into your bandwidth. Yes, and we don't really want to do that. So yeah. there's there's two ways around it. We can either use more bandwidth, you know, and up, you know, but if we keep the bit rate constant, um, you know, then, then, I mean, what happens then? You know, so this we're going to go ahead and build this um, because there's this is you know the, the other satellite people in the industry tell me that they use voice over IP for for similar systems uh, and you know and it and it works great and they think that the voice quality that we that we're getting with 16 kilobit per second Opus is great mm -hmm. so lots of thumbs up but I'm a little worried about the amount of overhead so if we if we keep our uplink to just voice codec frames and our own um, you know, uplink frame header, which tells you just the bare minimum. It does the authentication and authorization token. It tells you if this is a bit error rate test or if it's the last uh, frame that you're getting, you know, those sorts of things. Um, and it tells you who's sending it too, so that we're always legal. So every frame has the, you know, essentially your call sign in it. Okay, so we could just stay there and then that's what we transmit up to a payload, whether it's a ground sat on a mountaintop or whether it's in space as a as a satellite. Yep. And then maybe the satellite adds all of these other layers because it would have the horsepower to do so. And that on the downlink, when you receive uh, voice information, it then has RTP, UDP, IP, and you can use anything from VLC to HTML5 in order to receive and to understand audio. And Another advantage to this is that it can be audio or data; it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, that's the decisions that we're that we're trying to work through this week. And the upper part, that physical, and then P4XT uplink frame mm -hmm. and Opus, that's been demonstrated over the air now several times, and we'll be demonstrating it again in November um, at San Bernardino Microwave Society. We really like to demonstrate the bottom one by November. We may be able to. We're already starting to integrate in RTP. So we may get some of these answers, like, is it too much overhead? Does yeah. it make the signal too big? Yeah. Do we now have to have a deviation that's so huge that we, we exceed? 
Right. Exactly. And don't forget Doppler and don't forget this. Yeah. Don't yeah. Forget don't forget <laughs> <that>. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's um that's the 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 headlines. Um you know, right. it's uh the the good news is that it sounds great. It's uh it, the really just just like with cars and and engines, there's really no replacement for displacement. You know, you just you need more bits to sound good. Yeah, and, of course. Yeah. You know, and it so it does. It actually sounds pretty darn good. You can still tell it's a if you listen close, um, and then it it will actually pass through a bit of music at 16 kilobits per second, but it's not perfect. But boy, is it better than 3200? Mm -hmm. You know, it's so I'm, I'm we're all happy about that. I think that we would like now to to be able to to take advantage of those those protocol layers, but not if it's going to make it to where the the, we, the transmitting it is, uh, you know, too too big like if i have to go to a 200 kilohertz channel for this i'm gonna get a little nervous so yeah oh hi sumio i stepped away could have could have been oh he says he types hi to everyone hello sumio just wanted to say hi to you and see if you had any any questions or comments? And of course, you too, John, if you had any any questions or comments or advice. Uh, you know, I, I'm just really uh, joining uh, the meeting just to get an understanding of what you're up to, what you're up against. So um, sorry about the background noise. And, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm a little surprised you only have three participants. <laughs> uh, well, we, huh. try, we try to have office hours as often as possible. Yeah. Um, and and all and i try to to make the time uh varied and um uh i do know that we, a couple of people are in the lab and and working um uh, and are you then on the west coast now are you on the west coast now? i am i'm on on the west coast now so it's uh about a quarter after five yeah okay you know but uh i was ho i'm hoping to to allow uh as many people as possible to to touch base and to hear it firsthand and to to be able to contribute their ideas and and feedback uh so you know we'll we'll just keep keep doing it and keep moving around the uh moving around the clock so that we can get as many, many folks uh, up to date as want do you have a doppler uh, whatever that a doppler simulator or any kind mm -hmm. of you do yeah we do there's a couple of different choices um there's a there's a pretty good one um, it's actually external to GNU radio, but there's a, a, a one that's often used with GNU radio. And since we have our uplink in GNU radio already, um, that's probably the first one that we'll use to, to test it. And we also, um, have a, have, uh, a pretty neat Doppler, uh, simulator in MATLAB. Mm -hmm. Um, so in between, in between those two things, I think we'll be able to, to do a decent, simulation the 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 advantage to to gnu radio and i'm sure you could do this with matlab too um but with gnu radio you can also add other effects all on top of doppler so you know pointing error noise you know rain, uh rain, rain fade because yes these that are gonna you, you gotta really be uh take it that into consideration you might have an uplink of a couple of watts and a three-foot dish and then find out, you know, some light drizzle comes by and ruins your day. Yeah, that is a, the frequencies that we're looking at, they have that, well, they're all different. You know, it's uh, every, all, all these bands have their own yep. uh, very interesting quirks, uh, but yep. especially at 24 gigahertz. So oh, if we, <laughs> if we use that one, then we are definitely going to have to, um, and it's sort of an advantage in a way. So we get a lot of essentially like, an opportunity for a lot of free science, so to speak, mm -hmm. uh, with some good sensor fusion. So just just your communications link allows you to uh, learn how the how the atmosphere works and and how your signal is different from essentially from from like humidity and and mm -hmm. and like you said, rain. Yep. Yep. Ten ten gigahertz is an is a is our default downlink, and that is definitely affected by precipitation. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, five five gigahertz on the uplink. I don't know a little bit. 
uh, but not as dramatically as the others. Yep. Yep. Um, but yes, in in the simulations, uh, we will be able to put this in. The link mm -hmm. budget from from Jan King that we use has a, a, an extensive um, atmospheric modeling um, uh, function in it. Um, so it's it's really well done, and you can get uh, based on the where you put your ground station. So you pick, uh, you know, where oh, yeah. where where is it? Right. Right, and the, the, the different um, A, B, C, I forget the, um, yes, I haven't done that in a few years. So. Yeah, the, uh, yeah he, he, used, he included the ITU rain model. Right, in rain the, model. right. Yeah, it, and it's, uh, it's pretty cool because yep. there's places, you know, so just fooling around with it, it's, uh, there's, there's, you would, it, you would not, you would not expect that, that, uh, you know, this city versus, versus that area would be so different but they they definitely are yeah like so, Miami versus LA yeah <laughs> yes the one that kind of surprised me was Colorado versus New Orleans you know and dry air humid air yes and there's a there's quite a difference on some frequencies yeah. so so we're fortunate that we have we have that uh you know the the link budget that has all the the weather data in it um and lots and lots of places to configure uh, the system so it's a, it's a it's it's a it's a pretty hefty link budget we have a couple of us simpler ones too um you know just single sheets uh spreadsheets that uh you know can give you at least a first order uh approximation and they're conservative so they just assume uh you know it's worst case and you, you kind of want to start out with those and then yeah yeah and work your way up yeah. to the yeah <laughs> <laughs> have you done any trade space, uh, you know, uh, for um, doing like a, a swap analysis on, on different bands, uh, different physical sizes? Uh, I, I'm not sure what your space is on the, on the bird, how much room you have, uh, how much weight you can support, how much power dissipation you can handle. Uh, I'm, I was just curious to say, but I'm, I'm just throwing this out there because I'm ignorant, you know, I'm just kind of on the outside looking in. But if you had two uplinks, one at 1269 and five, and two downlinks at 10 and 24, have you done that kind of trade space? Yes, we started to, and it's it's that is ongoing, um, primarily because we started out assuming a five gigahertz uplink and a 10 gigahertz downlink. And then when we when we really kind of dug in to, to see what was out there in terms of, uh, spacecraft rather than just you know we were we've always assumed that we would be primarily focused on the communications part and just provide cards you know or you know circuits um so stepping up into well let's look at uh look at this more holistically and and see if there's any open source designs and when we we came across the the open source heo design uh from from jan king and from from his uh, team and decided to revive it well, the, there is additional frequencies there, and he had made decisions and had a, a, the start good start on a trade study. So we looked at combining these two, and then uh, the suggestion was, well, don't forget QL100 frequencies. There's an awful right. lot of right. ground right. equipment and lots of enthusiasm, and and I was like, well, okay, so let's start out with looking at, at everything we can uh, that we would want to accommodate from one gigahertz to to, uh, to 24. And then what works and what doesn't. The proposal from Jan King actually had a lot of frequencies on it, and and showed that the volume could be achieved with a six U spacecraft. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. it was still at a high, pretty high level. So the we do have because we have a, a slightly more advanced um, design that we in order for failure. Um, to, for it to fail over and not just fail. So the, the digital part needs to be able to fail gracefully. Uh, so we have some additional switches to to switch out the, the digital part and, and mm -hmm. turn it into more of a traditional transponder. Yeah. Um, and those, so those are additional losses and additional space and power consumption and complexity. Yeah. And so yeah. I don't think, uh, it does not look like that's going to be a deal breaker, um, but the detail work on that is is ongoing and so the the trade studies are are starting uh or have started and adding the additional frequencies really needs some lots of of course needs lots of of scrutiny 
it would be super nice to be able to to do them all um you know but we can clearly see what where we can modularize and and yeah, where we can yeah. you know drop yeah. things off and yeah so it'll it'll be all of this will be published uh, as we as it's created as we go along uh, so you can start to see the the beginnings of the the trade-offs and and especially when it comes to power consumption so that's the first thing that I think we're, we're going to need to to determine is the, you know, what what can we tolerate for power dissipation? Mm -hmm. We sort of already know, just based on other similar designs, what the upper limit is. Um, and so we better not have to exceed that. And the the use of electric propulsion, uh, having a or an array of, of lots of um, electric engines, that's going to change the power consumption Yes. pattern quite a bit so that's the first thing that we are trying to quantify and then out out of that budget you need so much for your engines can you achieve your mission and then after that can you achieve your communications mission yeah. <laughs> without yeah. having to go up in size so if this this is at least a six u um and you know the the, the people that that work in spacecraft say that it's achievable but it's uh, it's ambitious uh, and they're you know so uh, we're very fortunate to have um good advice and and people uh, kind of looking it over and and saying well it's not it's not crazy uh, which is great to hear are you trying to limit to six u or can is that like your threshold or is that your max oh that's a good question that's where that's it's it that's the bottom i think that's it's gonna be have to be at least six u i don't yeah. i don't see how you can fit um i don't see how we could fit in anything smaller with anything that we can afford to build or buy yeah. we you you could do this with us if you had an unlimited budget and and a, a large <laughs> team of people you know from you Good could <laughs> right exactly you you could cram it into something smaller you know but if you look at designs like the marco uh cubesats uh now it's a jpl project and and millions of dollars went into those cubesats but they're uh, six u cubesats with reflect array antennas they have approximately the same type of microwave gear that we're looking at and they went to mars and they both worked um so you know <laughs> and it's it's you when you look at a design like that yeah it's a uh, the, the higher end stuff and wow that jpl machine shop is amazing um <laughs> you know but when you when you look at the parameters and you look at how much they were able to fit in to to a, what they view as a very inexpensive spacecraft um then we're we're not out of line with uh with starting out as a 6u and mm. we may have to we may have to make it bigger i kind of hope not because then it gets a lot more expensive in terms of trying to launch it. 6U mm -hmm. is actually okay. I think we can we can hack that. We'll be able to do it. But if it has to be huge for some reason, um, then it's going to be I don't know. It'll be less likely to to get uh, to get in. It's going to be hard to get a launch period. But it'd be much more easy with a 6U than with something larger. Any any um, thoughts on on just having a single? I mean, we're doing all this digital. Or you're you you're doing all this digital analysis and and uh, modem designs. But any thought of just having a simple uh, analog transponder? Just yes, it, it should fit in the background. Yes, that's a. Uh... I think that that's definitely in the in the ballpark. Obviously, we want to put up something that's, uh, you know, digital in order to take advantage of of all of yeah. the benefits it yeah. gives you. Yeah, yeah. right. But um, we are pretty firmly pragmatic about like if if that digital stuff fails, or if you if you want to sh to you know the the switches aren't just there for uh, when it fails. Um, but yeah, it would essentially uh, be able to be able to switch over um, to just a transponder. What goes in comes out. That's going to have to be tested pretty thoroughly, um, you know, to have that. It's it's not a completely unknown method to to do this, um, you know. But if you design something for a for a digital, you know, link budget with all the advantages and 
gains and stuff. Um, and then say, oh, here you go. Here's here's a linear transponder. Then we're going to have to run the numbers and and make absolutely sure that it can work. Like you wouldn't want to say, okay, it failed, or we're going to switch it over uh, to be a transponder, and then and then no one would be able to hit it unless they had a gigantic dish. So that's just a gut instinct thing. So we want to be very cautious. But but the answer is yeah. Um, you know that it's uh it, that would just make the most sense. You don't want to to be you want to get the most possible out of a communications resource, and yeah, I mean, back back in the day, I mean, I'm dating myself, but back in the day, you know, I was playing with AO10 and RS15, and they were nice, simple birds. They were easy to to you know to gain uplinks and downlinks and, and, and get a decent signal report. And uh, you know, I was just saying, you know, they used to remember if they used to switch modes. At different times of the day or a week or, or and uh yeah i'm not saying to do that or not do that it, it's just i'm maybe reminiscing a little bit but um, well i mean but you're 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 sticking up for what's fun and that's the point simple, you, you know, know? <laughs> you know like the fm birds are now the cube sets are now they're just simple they're fm transponders everybody can jump on with simple antennas and because there's still going to be people who are going to say, oh, I don't want to get into this digital world, into the digital domain, and and start downloading firmware and 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 worrying about all that. So, um, you know, I, I'm just speaking maybe from a more elementary point of view, but just a thought. I'm not... No, I think it's wise. Um, I think I would say you're speaking from from a position of wisdom um so we'll we'll know a whole lot more when when we finish building the rf side of it and yeah. that's so far uh parts of it are built um the main the main part that that we've been spending time on is um is the digital algorithms and the modem yeah, design yeah i see that from the emails yeah. yeah so if that to me it's like okay well you have to be able to to have all this working end to end first before you then try to implement it in an RF hardware, yeah. uh, mainly because they, I mean we already have all the the dev boards and yeah. and the engineering equipment. Thank goodness we we were able to get that right before all of that equipment was purchased right before COVID, and the supply chain for some of this stuff is still messed uh, up. Like uh, the uh, yeah. So Jeez. we're just very, very fortunate that we're able to to experiment with large FPA, FPGAs and and with the, um, the ADRV ninety three seventy one, a really nice analog devices RFIC. Yeah. You know, it's so so we we're fortunate there. Um, it 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 always moves slower than you want. So it's like I would really like the whole end to end to be done already. You know, but it's making steady progress, and and as soon as that end to end starts happening and we can either really stress it stress test it in the lab uh or what i would prefer is to move it to a mountaintop somewhere in southern california or wherever it can be hosted and then people break it like figure out what doesn't work yeah. do you, you know converters, down converters already at your disposal we do we have a collection i've got little bags and boxes of all sorts of stuff to lash together um mm -hmm. You know, so so it's a we got a variety of things that are appropriate for for putting in a box and then putting on a on a mountain. Yeah. Um, so so we've been collecting enclosures and up and down converters and amplifiers and talking about band plans um, with the like with Scrubba and other people just to make sure that you know for the yeah. terrestrial part we don't stomp on anybody or make anybody right. super mad and. And yeah, that I think that that's that's going to reveal um, a lot. So I'm I'm betting that a lot of our assumptions will be challenged or will uh, or or will be borne out. You know. Yeah, I think a lot of you might see issues with the the group delay and the filters, the gain ripple in the filters. Uh, yes. Over a certain bandwidth, you don't want a lot of that'll start screwing your your eyes and cues. Um, significantly doing the transmission so um and then next thing you know you have all these bit errors and you don't understand why so, right exactly right that's that sort of stuff that that you, we know it's coming um we're reasonably sure that we can 
we can keep it under control, but you know, it doesn't work until you've tested it. And it doesn't work until you've tested it over the air. Test, test, test. All the yeah. Way. Yes, yes. Absolutely, Michelle. Absolutely. Yeah. The I think the only the part that we're rickety on is is uh, ironically it's a part that we demonstrated I think now and it this has been a while uh, we 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 started out with the the uplink receiver uh, polyphase filter bank mm -hmm. because we figured that might be um, tricky that's uh, an interesting math and and it's very cool and it's a very efficient way to do uh, sort of a receiver design um, and we so that's the first part that we demonstrated but that's the part that that I'm most concerned about duplicating over and over again. So to have a hundred, hundred simultaneous channels, even a really big FPGA, it looks like it'll work, you know, but like, like I said, it doesn't work until it's, it doesn't, it doesn't work until you test it That's and it, it yep. need to see it working over the air. The most we've ever had is eight channels. Uh, and it worked okay on, on a general purpose processor running GNU radio and getting yeah. a little bit of help from a USRP. So, eight worked uh but we but the the code base we were using from from theseus cores uh it's a team called theseus cores uh and they write so they write fpga code that targets the usrp like the 310 the ones with the bigger fpgas in them to to sort of offload dsp to the fpga in a sdr which is usually not doing a whole lot um usually the general purpose processor is doing all the fun dsp stuff and so that was their goal so we took their code and then and then ran it uh and we tried to to run it you know okay let's put in a hundred channels and it and it uh the code ha had a limitation it turns out uh only eight channels and anything above that wouldn't work and so mm -hmm. they then they you know they knew about this uh limitation so the next time around uh which will be soon if it, if they haven't fixed that yet which they may or may not have, uh, since most people, you know, eight eight channels is plenty for most <laughs> polyphase filter eggs, um, you know. But we'll have to dig in and figure out what exactly was preventing the you, that particular uh, SDR from from doing more than eight channels. So it's stuff like that crops up all the time, you know. And it, it's a complicated enough project to where all these sorts of uh, sort these sorts of things happen all the time. So it, that'll be that'll be really fun and. I'm I'm expecting that the that the filter bank will need some some head scratching and some some eye squinting and uh, some hard work and some optimization to get it to fit and to make it meet timing. Mm -hmm. So it's not impossible; it's just hard. So that's coming. The uh, you know we're going to do a pretty simple uplink receiver in in the fpga to start out with so it won't it won't even have a there won't be a polyphase filter bank to start out with it'll be just a couple of channels and pretty traditional uh receiver for the for the uplink at first mm -hmm. very good yeah very good yeah it's good stuff we've gotten um we've all learned a tremendous amount and the response has been uh, especially ever since uh, demonstrating at DEF CON, the response has been increasingly positive. So, Good. yeah, I'm happy about that. I think we're going to need some more FPGA people, uh, but that's yeah. almost a tr that's a truism. You always <laughs> need more FPGA people. You know, everywhere I go, people are asking me, you don't need FPGA people? <laughs> yeah. Hardware yeah. people in general. Hardware people are in uh, short supply. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Every, the, all of the people that I talk to that are trying to hire um, hardware designers are the number one thing, FPGA yep. and hardware. And I'm just, I wonder where they all are or, you know, what we're, I wonder what we're seeing, you know, I wonder what the, what's going on at, I don't know, uh, but, but it, uh, it appears to be a, a, a ongoing shortage. So. Yeah, uh, it, it certainly is. I'm, um, I, I just retired from being in the defense world. Um, and I was a hardware development manager for EW and, and uh, data links. And, uh, uh, you know, the people with experience were all the older gentlemen and ladies who were ready to retire. In the yeah. meantime, young, younger people didn't have the skill sets that we needed 
uh, especially in, in RF and firmware. Oh dear. Well, I mean, there are these. There is it. Is it because computer programming, software programming, no, is so popular? On it. A lot of it's there's too much reliance on it. Oh dear. Uh, okay. From an RF perspective, I'm saying now. Yeah. Uh, there, it, 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 you know, the the kids are learning a lot of tools in college that industry doesn't have or or you know is using, but they're not experienced enough to use it properly. So there's a lot of problems with parasitic problems and dielectric problems and, and that are not skills that they learned while they were in school. You know, so we had some problems in that arena where, okay, we're using the wrong board material or, you know, the wrong types of capacitors, let's say, for coupling and decoupling. So, yeah. Um, little nuances that take experience more than just something you're getting out of so, um, yeah, and as the it, frequencies go up, oh, all sorts yeah. of then more oh. and more weird stuff happens. Uh, and you don't even, you know, it, it, it's something almost very difficult to model. Yeah, and, yeah. And so you know, we the hard part was keeping people, and right now the industry is, is just stealing Peter to pay Paul. By and they're just going around in circles. These oh, guys, boy. And they're in. They go to a company, they get paid a lot of money, then they don't like the job anymore, and they move on to something else. Uh, but, yeah, there's not a lot of depth right hmm. now. Not wow. A lot of depth. And, and we're certainly, uh, we're struggling with it, you know. Huh, okay, not well. To mention, not to mention supply chain. Yeah, and not to mention supply chain. <laughs> You know, you yeah, know. I, I, oh, I, I'm, a, I'm a raging optimist, and, and I, I, oh, I guess... You kind of have to be, yeah. yeah. <laughs> have and, to be. Yeah, I suspect, I bet, you know, because uh, it's just uh, in everything that, that I'm involved with, the, the it's, it's supply chain challenges. And yeah. I suspect what will happen is it'll be bad until one day the log jam will break and all of a sudden it will be good. Yeah. Because supply yeah. chain is so complicated and there's so many different parts to it. It's like a very complicated design and you just keep, you know, keep working and working and working, and then eventually the, there's there's this weird organic thing that just kind of happens. Enough yeah. goes right to where you, right. to where you, you know, get a signal through or something like that. You know, it's it's at some point it has to improve. I guess I, is, I completely agree with you. I mean, the pendulum's going to swing the other way. Okay? Yeah, it, yeah, it, it always does. And, I, I'm and, I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> you and me, you and me both. <laughs> yeah. From from uh, supply chain and from the stock market. Yes. But, uh, yeah, I hear you. Because, yeah. uh, I mean, it was taking us 14 months to get, you know, Spartan 7 FPGAs. Wow. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah. The, the, wow. um, yeah, we're the, the ones that we're targeting, um, not available. It's, it's, yeah. uh, you know, and I, I, I guess you all, you all, we all learn these things, you know, by, by doing them, by trying them. And, you know, so early on, you know, we're just trying to get raspberry pies because they're pretty much a, a disposable <laughs> yeah. thing. Right. And we sprinkle them around and we do all sorts of stuff with raspberry pies. <laughs> and, you know, so I go to order it and it says 52 weeks. And I'm like, <laughs> I was like, Oh, 52 weeks. Okay. Well, you know, that'll, that, that's what it is now, but it'll get better. Hmm. Well, I didn't know that that's just the max. That's like, that's it's railed. So that yeah. was yeah. that was the tile that was the biggest number that they could have in their database at DigiKey or Mauser or wherever I was. And uh, you know, so I <laughs> I write a little email weeks and weeks later and they go, Oh, they're really <laughs> never coming. We're so sorry. When we say fifty two, that you should just think of that yeah, as that's where they cut it off at fifty two, yeah. right? But yeah. it could be eighty two, it could be hundred and thirty. It could be a hundred and thirty two, but they were like fifty day, we just figured that's it. You know, yeah. that's and yeah. so I was like, Oh, okay. You know, it kind of sunk in that we're never gonna get any more Raspberry Pis. It's just and ever so often you you'll get an order to go through. So a lot of these things, um, you know, I think we had gotten all of us, you know, not just at ORI, you know, and not just for these projects that we do, but like all of us that do embedded computer projects have got had gotten quite spoiled that you could just, you know, type a few lines into your web page and then within a day or two, you could have four or five powerful embedded computers. Mm -hmm. And then you're you're you 
then with uh, a few keystrokes, you can get your GitHub repository to do the, the you know, doing the thing that you want, uh, slap an RTL SDR in there and off you go. And you can do hundreds of different cool things and not being able to order them has definitely <laughs> changed the way that a lot of us approach, uh, you know, design. So a lot, a lot of reusing and, and rummaging through desk drawers and <laughs> repurposing, yep, pot, yep. you know, pies that might've been profligately used, you know, <laughs> maybe for silly things, you know, so it's, it's been, um, it's been challenging, but, you know, fortunately the big ticket stuff for, for our remote labs. So the lab equipment and the FPGA stations, uh, we've got some Plutos and we've got some, some DBS2 gear that can't mm. really get. So, you know, we've got the things for people to use. Now it's a, it's a question of continuing to advertise that if you want to do open source work and you're, if you're zany enough to want to do open source FPGA work, you know, then we've got you, we've got your back. Uh, and it's been the biggest challenge is just getting the word out that we're we're doing this and we'll support you and and you can learn stuff and and it it's stuff that's that's uh, in demand. So you know we have actually had people um, you know it's 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 one of those things like you mentioned before um, when people will show up and they'll learn a little bit and then leave. You know so we do actually have people that have 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 learned and contributed a bit and then been hired or promoted and then don't have time <laughs> to work on this stuff anymore. But I view that as like a success. That's well, that's one of our primary missions Certainly. is to educate Certainly. people. It's just like, Certainly. oh, congratulations on your... <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> In the meantime, they're leaving you high and dry. But yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes. Just... You know, so rinse, repeat, you know. So yeah. get yeah, yeah, getting the word out and making it clear that it's the invitation is it's supportive. We want you to try yeah. and learn and you know, all of this all of this can be yours. All this yeah. hard work, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yep. Well, thank you well, so much for coming. This is, oh, my this pleasure. is fantastic. I appreciate your time. Sure. No, ha I'm very, very happy to do it. Uh, Sumio, did you have any advice or questions or anything that you want me to, to do or to, to fix? Hey. Hi. Hello there. Mm. Fine, thank yeah. you. I learned uh, and UDP and RDP and uh, all all and so you talk later. So I uh, search and so I learned that. Oh, very good. Mm. Yeah, I can. And I'll, what I'll do is I'll put the um, I'll put the link to the our document mm. that talks about the like gives you a little more of the um, details, the tracking document. You might already have this Sumio, but let me. I'll put it in chat so that you you have a reference to to what we're what we're up to. Let's see. Yeah, that should that should work. So that's kind of a description. That's where all the the pictures from earlier. Um, it, and then we still have to fill in some of this. So it's uh, but it's it's coming along. This describes the uplink. This is our uplink tracking tracking document. Yeah, and if you any questions that you have, just let me know, and I will answer them. And I'll send it, I'll send the link to you in email too. Thank you. I'm not familiar with the industrial communication. I, um, like in the uh, 1980s, I uh, much fun of the packet radio. So that mm -hmm. in, the, in the future, uh, and, uh, we um, with the connecting the internet and over the um, satellite communication using the uh, internet, uh, UDP or the other, digital transfer communication. So it's a very interesting for me. Oh, good. I Thank you. Study. Yes. 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 This is voice and data. So it will yes, allow yes. you to do both. Yes. That's the goal. If the so. bandwidth is very narrow, and so the very, uh, we, we, I can uh, exchange any communication. And if wide into contact with the video or some other uh, picture or video, mm -hmm. Yes. It's not television, so it's a very, I'm, I'm very happy. <laughs> so just a moment. So. Good. Yeah, we're, we're going to do our best. I'm very proud of that. Mm. Awesome. 
Yeah, I sent it to you. I sent the link to you in, in email as well. Yeah. Thank you. You bet. Happy to help. All right. Well, I'm going to get going. I will see you all soon. We'll do yeah, this thank again. Thank you very much. Appreciate we'll, your time. Of course. Yeah, we'll do it thank again you. soon. Thank you. Thank you. All the best.